and good afternoon. <clears throat> I want to thank the Library of Congress and Dr. Mary Jane Deeb for this opportunity. And I thank you all for coming to my first book signing ever. What I have for you today is a tale of exotic jewelry and costumes worn by Bedouin and tribeswomen. It wasn't city women who owned most of these treasures. I will alert you to the couple of instances when you are looking at jewelry worn by the urban elite. Silversmiths throughout the mountains, the oases, and the seacoast made pieces to fit the needs and preferences of their customers, Bedouin and tribeswomen. The amount of jewelry in Yemen in the period I cover, 1900 to 1970, was simply extraordinary. A poor Bedouin woman in the southern coast of the Hadramaut told me that when she married, she had 11 kilos of silver, or 24 pounds. I have found Yemeni jewelry in huge amounts in Syria and Egypt, and even at special bazaars in the United States. Now the crafts, the jewelry, the architecture, and the terraces that extend from the tops of the mountains to the deep valleys are all evidence of how hard Yemenis worked. It was Yemeni Jews who produced the most intricate and labor-intensive jewelry. You will see their work in the first portion of my presentation in which I talk about the northern mountains and later in their most easternmost settlement in Haban, Shebwa. And I have given you a map in case you want to try to follow my peregrinations. Most Jews left Yemen in the late 1940s in Operation Magic Carpet, which took them from Aden in South Yemen to Israel. But silver dealers to this day use as their best sales pitch that the piece they're selling is Shogal Yahudi, or Jewish work. Now the bride had to have new jewelry when she married, so most pieces were not passed down. Thus, the jewelry you will see was made in the 20th century, most of it in the 1920s and 30s. The jewelry from the Hadramaut is often newer, from as late as the 1960s and 70s. My book is based on interviews I conducted in Arabic. For your convenience, I've given you a list of Arabic names and jewelry terms on the back of the map. Now we begin our tour with two young women. They're from northern Yemen. They are dressed in their best jewelry. They're going to some ceremony, either religious or a wedding or celebrating uh, the birth of a woman's first child. Now, Yemen is based at the bottom of the Arabian Peninsula. It's bordered on the west by the Red Sea, which brought in African influence, on the south by the Gulf of Aden, and on the east by Oman. Now, I traveled as far north as Raida. I couldn't go further north because there was a civil war up on the border. I traveled east to Sehut, which is the furthest east there were silversmiths working. And then I traveled through all the rest, up through the mountains, out in Marib, I got into homes, and in the, up and down the valleys of the uh, Hadramaut, and then east to Mahra. Now, northern Yemen was ruled by imams from the 12th century and the eastern part of Yemen was ruled by the British from the early 19th century. The two parts of the country were united only in 1990. So the jewelry reflects those differences, as you will see when we go from region to region. Now, why was jewelry so important in Yemeni society? Well, it was the basis of the economy for a long time for Bedouin and tribeswomen. The bride price was tied up in the marriage contract. The family of the groom paid for the right of the groom to marry the bride. 
after marriage, it became the family bank. It held the wealth for these itinerant people. But it brought women power. The jewelry became the property of the bride, according to Islamic law. She had the right of disposal. They drew on it in uh, hard times, but it had to be with her permission, ideally. Here I will show you two um, bridal uh, assemblages of jewelry. This uh, jewelry was, was uh, the property of a Bedouin woman on the southern coast of the Hadramaut. She dressed her young daughter in her jewelry. This is a young woman on the Tihama coast, the strip that runs north-south along the Red Sea. She is wearing her mother's wedding dress and her mother's wedding jewelry. And this belt that you see uh, was made by the grandfather of my consultant for the southern portion of my book. It's from the Hadramaut. Now Fatima, I talked to Fatima about her wedding jewelry. She is from a town outside of Zabid uh, in that same uh, coastal strip along the Red Sea. She wanted to make the pilgrimage to Mecca. So she made the decision early on to sell her wedding jewelry. But she loved this piece. She couldn't bear to part with it. And she would agree to be interviewed only when she had my promise that I wouldn't ask her to sell it. <laughs> now the jewelry gave the woman identity. The long piece on the right, she wore on one side of her head, and that told you that she was a married woman. Now the bracelets, top left, were made in Sada. They had a distinctive style. My bracelets are also from Sada. Fine granulation, they specialized in granulation. The piece below it, this funnily shaped gilded piece, uh, is in the, well, I think it's in the shape of a bat. No one could tell me where the shape came from. It had been worn so long. But that would tell you that a woman was married and that she was from Sayun, which is the largest city in the Hadramaut, the largest governorate of Yemen. Now, the two pieces in the middle were worn by the urban elite. They're light. They're finely made. They were costly, but they didn't have value in their weight. Both pieces would have been worn in Sana by the ruling family or by the families of rich merchants. Now the times were hard in this period from 1900 to 1970 and people sought protection, especially during childbirth but in life in general. The headpiece on the left has beads. These beads, particular beads, are made of plastic but they're in the color of coral. Sometimes they were coral beads. Whether they were coral or artificial beads, they would give you protection, especially from bleeding. The headpiece also has amulets in two shapes, the cucumber shape and the rectangular shape. Originally, they would have held a prayer or a verse from the Quran. Eventually, the shape took on the um, amulet value without having a prayer. The bracelets in the top right, whoops. The uh, bracelet on the left, the gilded bracelet with, it has um, protuberances, the shape of a woman's breast and the shape of a tomb. The bracelet itself is called kabur, meaning tomb. It was a bracelet worn by a Jewish bride on the occasion of her wedding probably it signified life and death. The bracelet to the right of it, gilded uh, silver, was made throughout the northern mountains. Uh, this one is from um, Mahuit. And there is a motif on that that we'll see again. It's the motif of a flower and a whale. I never was able to find out what the origin was or what the particular significance. I'll keep asking. Now, the amulets on the bottom right are all from a valley in the Hadramaut. 
The left one, the bottom left with the red stone on it, was put on a child to prevent toothache. And the red, again, prevented uh, bleeding. To the right of it is a special one worn in the Sayun area. It's, it's, I won't, I'll try to not give you the terms, but it was um, protected against nosebleed. And the next uh, one with, is in the shape of a sun and a crescent. Both uh, had, gave you um, good fortune. And this cucumber shape is a typical amulet, probably had a verse from the Quran in it. And then these bottom two, one is in the shape of a crescent, one is not, um, is in a square shape. They both carry the message, oh, save me, oh, my redeemer. In general, this jewelry gave women extraordinary pleasure and pride, and I saw that all over Yemen. Now, where did the silver come from? Well, it took me a while to figure that one out. Uh, it came from melted down Maria Theresa coins that were minted in the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Yemenis were exporting in the 18th century coffee, incense, indigo, and spices. And they had to get something in return, and they got these coins, which became the currency for the country. But they also were the source of the silver for the jewelry. So the bride always knew what she had in weight. It was always 83.3% silver. The coin always weighed the same. And she would always, um, she could follow the um, rise and fall of the value, the price of silver, and she would know what she had in her bank. It also was put in jewelry. You'll see that belt from the Marib, the top left. Um, that would indicate that the woman was prosperous. Now, the tradition of silver jewelry in Yemen goes back to the time of Queen Sheba. These are gold pieces, but the techniques are the same. You have granulation in two of these pieces, and the uh, top right chain, that is loop and loop chain, which uh, are two of the three most important techniques in Yemeni jewelry till uh, today. The third being filigree, which really came, uh, became much more prevalent in the 19th century. Now we start our tour of the cities, and we find ourselves in Sana. My favorite silver dealer in Sana was Hajj Ali Kaboos. And Hajj Ali Kaboos was the only one that had this kind of Fibber McGee closet full of treasure. And, Every time I went, I would say, oh, Hajali, let me help you organize your jewelry. You'll sell so much more. You'll know what you have. And of course, his response was always that sweet smile you see in the picture. On the bottom right, you get a taste of the extraordinary architecture in Sana'a. And there are two women wearing traditional Sanani women's garb. The outside, like a sheet that she wears as a cloak, was imported from India. But the mask that you see on the woman on the right with those big eyes was made in Sana, tie dyed in indigo dye. There were two uh, styles of jewelry that became prevalent in Sana, named after two prominent Jewish silversmiths. The belt, and you see the motif I mentioned before, the flower and the whale, uh, that is signed by Harun Balsani, who was the head of one of these major uh, schools of jewelry. On the bottom left is a piece signed by Yahya Badihi, and he uh, specialized in granulation. So if a piece had a lot of filigree, it would be called a Balsani style piece, and the same for granulation, it would be Badihi. On the bottom right, you have three wedding necklaces, made by another famous silversmith, Yahya Sala. This is a Jewish bride, photographed in the late 1930s. Um, it's simply extraordinary. Um, she is wearing probably artificial flowers. She has special herbs. 
She has a necklace under her chin. She has um, pearls up here in her headdress. But the most important thing for her were these large beads called, um, called kahat. These are the large beads. They came in two styles. One uh, was called a barley bead because you see the shape uh, of the seeds on the uh, bead itself. And the other was called a granulated bead. The silversmith always signed these beads. And once you got really good at identifying, you could tell who made what bead. I'm not quite that clever. Now, I couldn't get a good picture of a Muslim bride in Sana, so we dressed one. And in order to dress her, I got from a friend in uh, California, an American anthropologist, about 24 pictures. She couldn't publish her pictures, but she could share them with me so we'd know how to dress the bride. We did a practice session, and then this was the final result. She has pearls. She's a bit like uh, the mannequin here. It's the same, the same type of jewelry. She had to have lots of amber. That was what the Muslims wore, and it's compressed amber. Her bottom necklace, like here, was, has that large cucumber-shaped amulet and lots of uh, small uh, pieces of Russian coral. It's called Akht Marjan, the um, necklace of coral. She has pearls. Oh, and then on either side of her uh, head, she has herbs for good luck. They are... Um, Basil and rue. I had a lot of trouble finding rue. I had to um, have it sent to me from a nursery out of town, but we were authentic. And her top piece um, is, uh, has a piece of uh, silky fabric that has couched wide um, pieces of uh, gilded silver. Now we move north towards uh, Saudi Arabia to Sada. And the woman on the right, she's a Muslim, dressed for a uh, special occasion. She has uh, dressed her face with crushed herbs. That was her cosmetic. And it also offered protection against the sun. The long piece on the left was worn uh, only by a Jewish bride. This woman, this is a married Muslim woman in the, with the jewelry she would wear every day. The two long pieces hung from her braids and if you look very closely down here at the bottom, you'll see these two round pieces. She has her keys hanging from them. Now we're going west to, uh, we're still up in the mountains west of Sana. Haraz is an area that was settled by Ismailis, a special Shiite sect. The Jews in Haraz were multi-talented, they, they did different crafts, and they did embroidery. This is probably the finest costume in, uh, in my collection. Here they took thick plates of silver thread, they tied them together, and then they couched them onto the cloth so they wouldn't damage the cloth itself. And she's wearing pantaloons, similarly embroidered. The jewelry of Haraz is exceptionally fine. You see that same necklace that we saw here and we saw on the Muslim bride with the, um, and actually on the Jewish bride, they both wore them. And below it, you see the detail of the um, cucumber-shaped amulet. It's of the finest uh, filigree. And the bonnet at the bottom right was worn by a woman after she married. In this case, it would have been worn by a Jewish bride because the beads that are across her forehead uh, were worn only by Jewish brides, Jewish women. Now we have, are going north a bit. We're still west of Sana in a governorate called Mahwit and an adjoining one, Haja. And this location is called Bukhur. Now I'm told that this valley is deeper than the Grand Canyon. I can't prove it, but that's what I was told. And the two necklaces on the left were necklaces that were essential for the bride. She had to wear them. That's Mahwit City on the top left, and the other three pieces are from Haja, the governorate to the north. They specialized in beadwork. You see the bonnet top right and the belts. 
and that wonderful necklace on the bottom has a, a motif that was often used in Hajja. It's small circlets, but it's done in the shape of a, a Star of David. Now there are three mountainous areas, not far from the, um, the, the coastal strip, the Tihama. They're quite high, difficult to get to. And Bura was the northernmost one. There were five Jewish families that lived in Bura, and they produced uh, a jewelry in a special style. And when they left, the jewelry died. They took their secrets with them. Now, Rama, I'm wearing this piece. It's the finest filigree that I have seen in Yemeni jewelry. It's simply, it's not filigree, I'm sorry, the finest granulation. It's simply, simply extraordinary. And it's called a tayar. In that part of Yemen, they wore a piece of jewelry that would go across their chest. And I suppose if they were doing something, it didn't get in the way. The women are tribal women, again, dressed up in their best for a uh, special celebration. And you see the bottom uh, right is that necklace again with a small um, amulet in coral. But it's a special uh, necklace called birth, and it's given to a woman when she has her first child. Now we go to the, re the most remote of all these mountainous areas I uh, visited. It's Wasab. Wasab has two parts, lower, higher and lower. Uh, in the higher Wasab, they had Jewish silversmiths. They had departed. So they sent me down to lower Wasab, and there I met some uh, people from the Arifi family. They were the largest Muslim family of silversmiths in Yemen. They worked not only throughout Yemen, but also in uh, Saudi Arabia, at least on the west coast, uh, in Jeddah, probably Mecca. Um, the crown on the bottom right was made in Jeddah for a Saudi, perhaps, customer. And you can see in the slide in the bottom left how uh, in Wasab and in other parts of Yemen, they always built on the crest of the mountain preserving the maximum amount of land they could for agriculture. Also, it was easy to defend. These are more examples of uh, wasabi jewelry. In the bottom right, you see uh, two styles that they're famous for. They made the mulberry beads, which are in the middle. They're uh, of fine granulation. They were used as divider beads. But then in the two other beads, you see what I call faux granulation. The, the silver was uh, annealed, pressed out, and then pressed into those uh, shapes, and then cut into diamonds and used that way. And that's a mark of uh, wasabi work. Now we have moved to the um, seacoast, to a town called Zaidia. It's small. There were two silversmith families, Darwish and Bland, who produced this cutout work. It's um, jewelry that, this type of jewelry was only made there and is quite uh, easy to uh, identify. Now Zabid is a town further south in that same uh, coastal strip. It was very famous in the Middle Ages for its science and it was very important in the uh, Islamic world at that time. You see the bridal costume of Zabid that's worn to this day. And um, you see in the bracelets on the right, the bottom bracelet, I'm sorry it's upside down, but it says Rafa. Rafa was the name of the largest family of silversmiths in that part of Yemen. And they made um, all different types of uh, jewelry, the kinds that you see here. Now on the picture in the bottom left, the top bracelet is hollow, it's incised, it has no granulation, no filigree. I wasn't sure where it was from. I was very suspicious. And then my main uh, informant in uh, Sabid, in the bottom right photo, Muhammad Yami, introduced me to Muhammad Arafa. And it, was, it turned out it was his grandfather who made those bracelets. Now we are jumping east to the Hadramaut, the largest governorate in Yemen. 
This is, I had to show you Shibam, the skyscraper city of the desert. It has houses, uh, buildings uh, eight stories high, all made of mud in that special mud architecture of the Hadramaut. It's the only city of its type that I know of that is, was built in a totally flat area, in a desert area. Um, its buildings are its main uh, fortification. It was more uh, a wood producing city. Uh, she, um, Sayun, the uh, city very nearby, was its source uh, for uh, jewelry. Uh, Sayun had many, many silversmiths. The dress on the bottom left, it's red velvet with couched embroidery. It was the wedding dress worn by the Bedouin in that area. And then on the bottom, um, on the middle right, you have a amulet made of hyena bone in a crescent shape. And it had to be worn by the bride in uh, Sayun. And there is another one of those uh, wedding belts. Now we go to one of my very favorite places in Yemen. <laughs> It's called Wadi Duan, which means it's the Valley of Duan. You see in the left what it was most famous for. It's painted um, mud buildings, and it was famous for honey. And the honey came from the elb tree, and I've given you the scientific name here. I went to uh, Hajarain, a large uh, city in Wadi Duan, and talked to a silversmith, and he showed me this enormous wedding belt, which weighed 15 pounds. And he said, oh, if I only had a bigger bride, I could make a belt that weighed 20 pounds. <laughs> the uh, young women in, uh, throughout the northern Hadramaut, actually, are the uh, shepherds. They are out caring for goats and uh, sheep in this difficult, rocky-filled uh, oasis. Uh, the middle necklace, also it's a crescent shape, was worn only by married women in that area. And the necklace, top left, was um, worn by a bride. And then you have another uh, amulet. And the bracelets on the bottom right were made only by one uh, silversmith. Uh, and they have eye shapes to um, repel evil spirits. Now we've moved to the southern Hadrami coast. Here is a Bedouin bride in a wedding shop. Maybe she's shopping for a wedding dress. Could be. And there uh, in Sheher, it was another silver making uh, city. There were several families of silversmiths. The largest uh, and perhaps the most important were the Alamaris. And you see a belt uh, on the bottom that was made by the leader of that family. That's the gate to the silver area. And on the bottom left, you have two necklaces that were always worn together. You can see how different the jewelry is in the Hadramaut from the jewelry in the mountains. Uh, the, the necklace on the left is called a Mahri Loops, and the necklace on the right has two very distinctive beads that were made only in Sheher and are no longer made. One is the wire-wrapped bead, and the other is the flat, flattened-out bead. Now, in the middle, we have those earrings that were worn in great numbers in the ears. One Bedouin woman had me count the holes in her ears. She had nine holes. They could have up to 11 in each ear. The bracelets on the right, made in Sheher, are made of gilded silver, which then has been rubbed with turmeric and a special resin to get a very bright orange color. They also used it to rub onto um, embroidery uh, and costumes. Top right are two necklaces from a fishing village to the right of Sheher. Um, I met uh, the, um, the last silversmith from that family, and you can read about him in my next book. Now we're in Mahra. We're next to the uh, Omani border. The Mahri share a language with people across the border. It uh, dates from um, early, before Islam. It's a South Arabian language. And their jewelry styles are often similar. 
although there also was a lot of Indian influence uh, in this jewelry. There were two silversmiths who lived out there in a valley who were Indian who taught the um, perhaps the most important uh, silversmith who uh, later worked in uh, Sehut, which is where I went. The two pieces on the left were worn, again, it's that piece that's worn down one side of the head to indicate the woman is married. Um, the woman on the right is wearing an enormous nose ring. It's the only place I ever saw it. I didn't see it in books on uh, Omani jewelry. And the disc, is one of the finest pieces uh, produced in uh, Sehut. Now we go to uh, Haban Shabwa, which is right in the middle of what was uh, South Yemen. That's where you had the easternmost settlement of uh, Jewish silversmiths, and they all apparently worked in uh, silver, and they did very good work. The um, belt, top right, you see the buckle is their work. And the buckle in the bottom uh, right belt with those large uh, carnelian stones also was their work. Now I can't finish a tour of Yemeni jewelry without, without talking a bit about the role of women. It took me a long time to discover the role of women because men were never very forthcoming about it unless you knew the right question to ask. I met with a uh, silversmith in Hodeida. His wife had traveled to Saudi Arabia. She wasn't there, so I couldn't interview her. But he let me photograph her belt. She wove that belt from one crochet hook, the backing, and he said she could do it very quickly. She would go to women's teas and gatherings and just sit there and work away while she carried on conversation. Her husband, did the pieces, and again we have that whale and flower motif. He did all the pieces and the buckle that uh, adhere to that belt. Now this is, was made in Sana'a, and it was made by a Muslim silversmith. He was one of the first to work in jewelry after the departure of the Jews. It's one of the finest of its type that I saw, and I learned rather late that the way this thing was put together, the husband made the container. He made the granules that you have to use very high heat to get the silver to roll into those small balls. But then he would leave them at home, and he would go off and work in the workshop with other men, and she would sit at home with tweezers, and she designed that. That was her work. He would come home at night and solder it. Then, I went with a friend to a place high in the mountains in Mahuit where they specialized in items to be sold to tourists in Sana. So they use low silver or often nickel. And we were going from workshop to workshop, meeting with different men, and then we were going down these stairs and there were some very thick curtains. And suddenly, this hand appeared from between the curtains saying, come, come. And the men looked and rather sneered a bit. And they said, oh, the women want you to go and have tea. So we did. We went in to have tea. And the first thing that happened was a young woman came over to show her work. Not only had she assembled those pieces, but she had soldered them. Now, we never would have known. Of course, I don't think I asked the right questions. So you can see then what happened to it. At the, at the right is the base of a uh, dagger case. And then uh, bottom left, you can see where her pieces have been added. And then the final pieces on the right. Now, out back in Hadramaut, down a remote valley, the women wove this extraordinary belt which was very long, very intricate, and the wire is quite thick. I never was able to see anybody do this, but I have documentation. If you look carefully at this painting, you will notice that the, a woman is sitting there knitting this belt, and it's curled up at the bottom. It's a young woman in high school, painted perhaps her mother, doing that wonderful belt. Well, I've given you a tour, an abbreviated tour. There's much more information and many more pictures in the book. Thank you so much. Now, 
if there are questions. Yes, Mary Jane. There were, uh, there were silver mines in the time of the, when the Iranians occupied Yemen long before Islam. There was a working silver mine, and that's the last one I could find uh, evidence of. Yes. No, what really happened, um, when I worked, I mean, we were a tandem couple with three children. I never had time to think. And you never thought about retirement. Um, uh, one uh, woman who uh, organized um, exhibits for me later, she uh, was in the bead society. I met her. I went to a bead society meeting. She persuaded me to organize my jewelry, which was a formidable task. And then, um, you know, she put together an exhibit, and that was the beginning of exhibits. And that led to participation in this seminar on Yemeni culture, where I talked about uh, Yemen and that the jewelry, really, I, what I was doing was showing pictures. I knew nothing. And um, I was encouraged to do it. And then suddenly, when my husband died, I needed something dramatically different. And I wrote a, a pro proposal and got it, and away I went. And I was very uh, nervous because I wasn't an anthropologist. I wasn't sure my Arabic was up to it, and I wasn't sure I could do it without help. And um, it was really, the Yemenis made it very easy. Nobody had ever talked to them about their work, and they were thrilled to talk. The women got such honor by, uh, from being asked by a foreign researcher about their lives and their silver. You could just, they glowed. They actually grew in stature. It was, it was so exciting. Yeah. Yes. Sure. Oh, thank you. Well, good questions. Um, silver was important in a lot of places. Um, the transition to gold took place at different times. Um, I think in uh, the Mediterranean area, probably the 30s, 40s. In Yemen, uh, it came later, uh, partly because they were isolated, partly because um, it didn't it, silver lost value compared to gold, but that again happened rather late. Um, so the, the, in Yemen, they gave up uh, silver jewelry for a number of reasons. After the revolution in 62, it was considered old fashioned in the north. Um, in the south, uh, you really had to have too much silver jewelry to uh, hold the family wealth. Gold was better. It was less and it was uh, more useful. Um, and then I think really when Yemeni workers went to Saudi Arabia in great numbers in the uh, 70s, um, they came back with new ideas and uh, gold was fashionable. Yeah. And uh, so it's um, the old ladies like me still love it. But uh, similarities, well, you know, I haven't spent a lot of time in Morocco. Uh, the Yemenis did, um, provide the soldiers for the Arab revolt, and probably some of them settled there. I never have been completely clear how the, the work of silversmiths spread. I know that there were Yemenis, I think, who settled in southern Egypt and carried some Yemeni styles there. Of course, there is a strong connection with Ethiopia. Um, with North Africa, I've heard that Yemeni jewelry could be found in Morocco. Um, some of the styles, of course, you always have these amuletic shapes, and the, the jewelry has uh, similar symbolism. 
um, in Morocco and uh, you have Nielo. Um, there's very little uh, Nielo in 20th century uh, Yemeni jewelry. There's none that I know of. You did have it earlier. Um, but because I think the way the, um, the jewelry was used as part of the contract, it's how, how central it is, um, I think that uh, you find similar shapes uh, across the whole area. Yes. Well, in very small numbers. The sad thing is that when the, the Jews left Yemen, they left a great void because in Yemen they still needed the jewelry. But when they got to Israel, um, the jewelry was largely unknown. Again, I haven't studied this as much as I would like to, but uh, there was little demand for it. I have interviewed uh, a couple of uh, uh, Jewish uh, silversmiths about this. and. Uh, they were able to work in Israel for a, for a short time making jewelry, but after that, the, they were taught really to use different designs. I think many of them continue doing jewelry, but perhaps there are very few who still work in the same, uh, the same tradition. Uh, Paula Eibloom, who's here, knows more than I do but <laughs> on that topic. Yes. Now the Yemenis say Hut. Now, if you look at this, I think I wrote it there. It's Hut wa Zuhra in Arabic, which is whale and flower. But I, I it's an entry. I've looked in books, but not extensively. Um, maybe somebody, you know, it's a good project for you, Carol. <laughs> yes. Oh, um, you will notice that um, most of these pictures date from an early period. I borrowed a lot of these photos of women. Um, the women that I could photograph, well, you never knew. Um, down on the Red Sea coast, it's, it's easier. Um, in Marib, I don't know how I lucked out, how those women agreed to pose for me, but they did. But it wasn't easy, and it was often the sons who did not want their mothers uh, photographed. Um, it's, and in it, Yemen, uh, many more women veil than used to, partly uh, as a result of the workers returning from Saudi Arabia, I think. They're more conservative. Uh, it's not easy to photograph women. Um, I learned a lot from silver dealers. Uh, and in some, well, I had two consultants for the book, one in the north, one in the south. They didn't know a lot about the silver from the other, the other part of the country. Uh, does that answer your question? Good, Leanne. Well, I'm going to be doing more research on amber for the next book, but the pieces that you see here are, um, and I'm going to be using Yemeni terms for amber. Amber, of course, is a resin, and it's soft. And so whenever you see a bead, it means that it's been compressed and reshaped, mixed in different ways to get that square shape. It would never be a natural amber. This, these beads are called sadak in Arabic. It means that they were made of actual amber that was ground up and maybe mixed with something else and compressed to get a hard bead that will survive. But there are different qualities and there are, there are plastic beads of this color. For the woman wearing the jewelry, it had the same amuletic or protective value. But in terms of real value, there's a huge difference from Bakelite, from Copal in Africa, from different gradations, mixes of amber. It's a whole other long chapter, at least. Yes. I have a question uh, based on an experience in Turkey with my wife and daughter about 20 years ago. Uh, in Turkey, they make silver jewelry, or they traditionally made silver jewelry. Mm -hmm. And my wife and daughter were, of course, always happy to get some. Mm -hmm. and And the gentleman who 
said to me, you know, the silver they're buying didn't come from Turkey. And I said, okay, where did it come from? He said, Mexico. And then I said, and the work? He said, all done in Thailand. And this was very, very good reproduction. How long ago was this? Uh, Anna's 36, so she was 18, so 18 years ago. And I was wondering whether that kind of international commercial system is beginning to enter the <laughs> Yemen. It's awful. <laughs> but I, I lived in the old city, and uh, I, there was a market where I would go to buy my vegetables and things, and they were selling Chinese reproductions, actually, of that bottom necklace, that Akhtamar John, that important piece, in tin and, um, I don't know, it was like some type of plastic, selling it for the equivalent of $4. No, they, they, they um, well, another time, uh, and I found this both in Eastern Turkey and I found the piece in uh, Sheher, very similar pieces. They weren't made from silver, but they were well made and a nice design and interesting pieces, but they weren't Yemeni. But in Yemen, um, the work uh, continued. I interviewed silversmiths who were primarily my age. Their sons had gone into different work, but they knew the work. If they could make a living, they, they would continue to do the work. But they, I mean, with Yemen and the state it's in, there are no customers. It was foreigners who were buying the jewelry they were making, so it's very hard. Thank you. Well, thank you, Marjorie Ransom, for such a wonderful uh, and an informative lecture. There will be a book signing, as I mentioned, right over there, if you're interested in buying one of her books. And thank you all for coming. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.